Good afternoon and welcome to Clinical Pearls. Don't forget you can join our discussion today by typing your questions into the chat box. We'll answer as many questions as we can during our broadcast. We want to give a, sh a special shout out to all the people that have been watching. We have had participation from Oklahoma all the way to Pennsylvania. We'd love to know if you're watching the show in groups and how you're using the information that you get from each show. So if you could take a minute after the show today, just comment in the comment box below and we'll use that information in the future. We are excited to have Dr. Dana Mitchell here with us today. Dr. Mitchell has over 17 years of nursing experience, including 12 as a nurse practitioner. She has cared for heart failure patients, both inpatient and outpatient. She has also been a nurse practitioner with the UAB Heart Failure and Heart Transplant Clinic. She holds a specialty certification in heart failure nursing and is the current chair for the Patient Education Committee for the nursing, I'm sorry, for the American Association of Heart Failure Nurses. All of our guests have lots of, of accolades, it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, she has a special interest in care coordination and transitions of home, uh, specifically for heart failure patients. So we're really lucky to have her here. Uh, thanks, Dana, for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, so I think most of the people in our audience, um, and myself included, we, we know some things about heart failure. We learned about it in school. But can you give us just a refresher? What is heart failure? Sure. So the heart's a pump. Its job is to pump blood and move oxygen and nutrients throughout the body so that oxygen can be delivered to the tissues. Um, heart failure then is the inability of the heart to fulfill that job, to efficiently move blood and get blood um, and oxygen to the tissues to meet the demands of the, the body. What causes it? Heart failure can be caused by many things. Um, sometimes it's structural damage related to heart attacks. Um, it could also be um, exposures to certain, certain toxins. Alcohol comes to mind, also stimulants, amphetamines, um, and um, even some medications we use for chemotherapy. Um, also, um, sometimes, you know, heart failure can be congenital. Sometimes people are born with heart defects. Um, also, uh, it could be a hereditary familial sort of a problem. Okay. You gave a really great description of it when we were just kind of talking about different things about heart failure in preparation for this interview. Um, you talked about the squeezing and the... Sure. And the filling, can you tell us? Right. So I love that example. There's basically, there are two um, kind of components of heart function. Um, one is the systolic component, so the actual squeeze, and how the, the heart muscle itself squeezes to propel blood forward from the ventricles out into the, the rest of the body. Um, but the other component that sometimes um, we don't think about quite as much is that each time the heart squeezes, it also has to relax, and in relaxing, it um, sort of the ventricle opens up and relaxes so that n more blood can load in. So if you can't, um, it, so diastolic uh, heart failure, it would be a failure of that part of the cardiac cycle where it won't, it doesn't relax very efficiently. So normally, when the blood or when the heart ejects blood, it should eject about half of however much blood is in that chamber. So if there's 100 milliliters in the chamber, it should eject 50 or a little more than that. Um, if the if you can't get blood in however to that chamber and the blood is not there's not very much blood in that chamber 50 percent of not much is not much right so then that is um diastolic heart okay. failure. all right great so how many people are affected by heart failure there are um 6.5 million people according to the latest american heart um numbers uh, that are living with heart failure right now. Is that just in the United in States? In the United States. Wow. Yes. Yes. It, that number is projected to grow by 2030. They think that it will be 8 million people really? living with heart failure. That was a lot more people than I anticipated. It is a, a huge problem. Um, so what is the age range of all those people? Is this not something we need to worry about until we're older? Or well, so heart failure is the number one diagnosis, admitting diagnosis within the hospital for people over the age of 65. But it's not just people that are older, it's also um, in younger people as well, especially when you consider, um, you know, the, the toxins and, you know, drug abuse and things like that that can happen. Sometimes you get very young people um, having heart failure. What are some of the signs and symptoms that you would see in a patient with beginning heart failure? Um, 
early on, generally, you start to see a decrease in their activity tolerance. So that is, um, you know, I used to could walk to the mailbox without trouble, and now I'm short of breath walking to the mailbox, or I have to stop three times before I walk down the street, you know. So um, they'll start to be less able to do those things, either because they're just tired, very, very tired, or because they truly get short of breath um, in doing those activities. Um, other things that you might see, um, people become short of breath, and that's usually related to a buildup of fluid in the body, um, and in the lungs specifically. Um, laying flat is a big challenge, mm -hmm. so difficulty laying flat, so you know, now they'll have to sleep up, you know, propped up on pillows. Um, and as nurses, we can actually kind of quantify how severe that is by asking how many pillows. They have three pillow orthopnea. Um, some people have to sleep in recliners because they can't sleep in the bed at all. Um, so those are kind of some of the early signs. You'll start to also see swelling, usually in um, the legs, just because of gravity and that dependent edema um, that'll happen from having too much fluid on board in the body. I can imagine if the early signs and symptoms are just kind of being tired, is it misdiagnosed or how would you even get a diagnosis of heart failure? So it, it can, can certainly be because the symptoms can start very vague um, and so it certainly could be uh, misdiagnosed. So um, when a person um, goes to talk to their um, healthcare provider, they'll explain their symptoms, tell them what's going on. They can probably expect to get an electrocardiogram or an EKG. Also probably expect to get um, an ultrasound of their heart, which we call an echocardiogram. And that echo, that um, echocardiogram, the ultrasound, um, will actually watch the heart as it moves and you can see um, how well the heart's squeezing and if it's not relaxing and all of those things. So should they present first to a primary care physician or do people come through the e emergency room with so, this? Um, people, um, sometimes when they get to the point of extremis, will show up in the emergency room having never known that they had heart failure and have a new diagnosis. Uh, they short, show up short of breath, they're coughing, um, they're, um, their the sputum, the secretions that they bring up tend to be very thin because it's not really mucus, it's actually water um, okay. and fluid from their lungs. Um, thin frothy secretions. Also, um, sometimes they show up with blood pressure that's just tremendously high and they're having, you know, problems with that um, only to realize that they have too much fluid on board and they're just volume overloaded related to the inability of the heart to move that fluid around. Okay. What do you, what do you think that we should know um, as nurses for our patients that have been admitted? Is I wonder about patients that are admitted for something else and may be in the beginning stages of heart failure. Maybe we don't even know or have, they don't have an official diagnosis. Sure, yes. Um, and that's where history taking comes in. It's so important for nurses um, to get a, try to get a thorough history from their, um, from their patients and from the patient's family members. Try to check all those medications and see if you can get clues of what the patient's on. Um, but yes, it happens frequently that people may come into the hospital for something else, and maybe it's something traumatic, or you know, and the person can't give you a history, um, and that we give them, you know, fluid, right. IV fluid. They're getting antibiotics, perhaps, that are, you know, giving all this extra fluid, and then they wind up being overloaded because right. of what all we've given them. So, um, as nurses, we need to be watching for those signs, you know, in our patients who you know, whether they have the heart failure history or not, you know, you want to watch for those signs of volume overload. So shortness of breath, um, shortness of breath that's worse lying flat, um, edema, and even vital signs. Um, so if they're volume overloaded, blood pressure may be very high until the point that they, the heart can no longer compensate and the cardiac output drops and blood pressure drops with it. So that, would that be kind of a, a later finding, the, the blood pressure dropping? The blood pressure be... finding, yes, dropping would be a later finding. That's a, um, evidence of decompensation. Yeah. So they're getting to the point that, you know, the heart compensates as long as it can, and then it gets to the point that it's overwhelmed and just can't just anymore. Gives out. And that's when, the, that's when the blood pressure starts to drop. And there are medications um, that we use that can help um, in a, a situation like that and devices and things that can help to improve that heart function. Um, and we just, you know, do what we need to to get that heart function back and that blood pressure back up. Right, right. What kinds of things, that would be one, I think, would be a thing that a nurse would need to report 
immediately. Absolutely. What other kinds of of signs that, that they're decompensating or what kinds of things would a nurse need to report sure. urgently? Um, one of the um, signs that might could be easily overlooked, I should say, um, is a change in mental status. So a, their mentation becomes a little more cloudy. They're not quite as oriented or quite as able to tell you answer questions um, as they were previously perhaps or um, maybe they're more somnolent, more sleepy oh. than they have been. So those are um, those are certainly some signs. Um, again looking for the shortness of breath, um, looking for um, cough and productive cough, edema, um, and just severe fatigue. Also it's important, remember you I mean, we all we have to touch our patients, and sometimes yeah. if you go over and you you touch your patients, and even if they're sleeping and they're not, or maybe they're difficult to arouse or something, but if they're cold and clammy when you touch them, it's a very, like that's a very advanced um, sort of situation, and so those are things that you need to be in tune to. So a thorough physical assessment Absolutely. sounds like you know. Absolutely. Is Those who know me around here, I'm yeah. very <laughs> pro my physical assessment. And because these can be very vague findings, you know, and you want to be proactive rather than reactive. And right. So to, to find these things um, before the patient gets into, you know, trouble, into extremists is important. I thought it was really interesting, and I guess I hadn't thought of it before, is that they get a little to get the confusion. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the mechanism behind that? Um, it, so cardiac output, heart rate times stroke volume, if we can't move forward blood and we don't have um, much in the way of stroke volume, then we have poor upward blood flow um, toward the head. So poor inadequate cerebral perfusion. So is that reversible? Does that get better if you treat the Yes, the heart so if we can improve the cardiac output and we can improve the blood flow to the brain, then um, they'll usually perk back up for you. Yeah. Okay. What kinds of medications are these patients typically on, either in the hospital or, or I assume that we'd start in the hospital and then perhaps be discharged? Sure. Myself, so right? um, within the hospital, we see um, we're going to use medicines, IV medicines, maybe dibutamine, milrinone, those inotropes that are going to help um, to improve heart squeeze, heart function. Um, we, as a transition to outpatient, there are guideline directed medical therapies. So these are medicines that have been researched for years and are known to be of most benefit and improve heart function. Um, or improve quality of life and longevity for patients. Examples of those um, are beta blockers, specifically either carvedilol, sodalol, or, um, or not sodalol, um, sorry, um, metoprolol or carvedilol are the most common. Um, also, um, they're on ACE inhibitors generally, so um, the pril drugs, your lisinopril, your enalapril, um, those sorts of medications. So we're targeting um, both managing blood pressure and managing the afterload that the heart's having to pump against, as well as some hormonal um, mechanisms that cause changes in the heart structure. And so these medicines can also target that. What are some, uh, some side effects from these medications? Because I can imagine trying to help quality of life perhaps sure. could impede that. Sure, well. so when um, patients are on these medications, Quite often, so we do get blood pressure effects, um, and sometimes they are significant enough to cause dizziness and things like that, especially um, orthostatic blood pressure changes. So if people are lying in bed and then they go, they sit up and then even stand, they'll get dizzy and are at risk for falling. So we want to be sure that our patients know about that and to take their medicines. Um, take their medicines as prescribed, but then as they start to get up and move, they should move slowly and sit up, maybe dangle on the side of the bed for a few minutes or the chair or whatever before they go to standing and trying, you know, to walk. Should patients that are on these medications and have been diagnosed with heart failure, should they be active? They should be active. We, act, we absolutely want um, patients to be active. So um, the general guideline for everyone, uh, according to the American Heart Association, is um, 150 minutes per week of aerobic activity and so that's basically 30 minutes five times a week. Um, so 
our patients may not be able to be quite that active to begin with, but we always encourage them to do whatever they can. So if it's walking for five minutes out and five minutes back or whatever works um, to get started. And so as they, um, as we continue medical therapy and potentially their heart failure gets better. Also diuretic therapy and we're managing fluid better. We teach them about their um, salt and fluid restrictions. That's another big thing um, with heart failure. But as all of that kind of comes together for them and they start to feel better, then they can push it a little further and they'll be able to listen to their body and know when, when their endurance is improving. And so you start with five minutes out, five minutes back, and then maybe next week we push it to seven minutes each way. So, um, and you just, you work it up as you can. And we're always very encouraging of um, that for our patients. Besides the fall risk from the uh, blood pressure, is there anything else that they, a warning sign that maybe they're pushing it too much? Yes, so we never want them to push it to the point of having any sort of chest pain or, um, lightheadedness if they you may have a little bit of shortness of breath um, but that's something that should recover very easily if you sit down you should be able to cover quickly recover quickly and if you can't recover quickly then that is probably a trigger for a need to be seen a need to um, follow up with your health care provider um, but yes we want them to we want them to push themselves but not to the point of lightheadedness or chest pain okay Good. We have a question from our audience. Is a diagnosis of heart failure always fatal? Um, the diagnosis of heart failure is not always fatal and not immediately um, fatal. There are many different stages of heart failure and so um, heart failure is a naturally progressive disease and it does get worse over time. But with good medical management, um, people we, we've seen in research and we've seen in clinical practice and anecdotally that people will um, can have a, a good quality of life for a long time. The um, prognosis, prognosis, sorry, statistically for heart failure is that about 50% of people are gone and passed away within the first five years of their oh. diagnosis. Um, but the 50% of people who live further than that, what are they doing? They're watching their fluid and sodium intake. They're taking these medicines that are research proven to be um, beneficial um, at the right doses. We know the right meds, but we also know the right doses. There are target doses and we need to, we try to get the patients um, to those doses. Um, we um, also teach them to do daily weights. That's another important thing in self-monitoring. Um, as they, every day, if we tell patients that they gain more than two pounds overnight, that's not real weight. You can't gain real weight that fast. That's fluid. And so you can start to see a trend. And if they're gaining more than two pounds overnight or more than five pounds in a week, we have them, you know, follow up with their care provider and, you know, let us know so that maybe if we need to make adjustments in medical therapy or whatever, we can do that or bring them in to be seen. Um, that also, though, gives the patient a little bit of control in that it allows them to kind of see the results of their their efforts you know so as if they're gaining or if if they're gaining weight then they can kind of look at the scale and think oh well, what did I eat yesterday oh I had that hot dog so that's probably a bad idea let's you know <laughs> fix that behavior and so it can kind of help um, and, and it's a motivating I think in some ways to feel like you you have that control right do you ever advocate for them to manage their own medications? Absolutely not. Do not um, manage your own medications. And, you know, so sometimes you'll have people tell you, oh, well, my weight went up by five pounds, so I doubled my, my, my diuretics, my Lasix dose. Please call us. <laughs> call your <laughs> healthcare provider before you do those things. Um, there are times that we, some patients will have a um, prescription that says, you know, to take this as needed. You know, take, take this Lasix pill once a day if your weight goes up by so much. But right. those are um, those are very specific cases. It's in general, please do not change or adjust those doses of your medications. I knew heart, you heart meds or otherwise. Right, or, or otherwise, any, you're any right. meds. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Um, so if, if the patient is in the hospital, we'll, we'll start there and then talk about discharge, but in the hospital, you know, we're putting them on this fluid restriction and salt restriction. I can imagine, especially in a newly diagnosed person, that you may meet some resistance from, from those patients. It's gonna be a big lifestyle change, right? It's How do you a, deal with that? It's a very big lifestyle change. So um, we, 
in general, people with heart failure are restricted to about two liters of fluid a day. And that's all the fluid that they drink. That's their water that they're taking with their pills and their milk and their coffee and their soda, whatever they're drinking. Um, it's also anything that would melt into fluid. So some people like to eat ice, that counts into their fluid restriction. Um, watermelon also, because there's so little fiber, that counts, it's mostly water, that counts into your fluid restriction. Um, puddings, ice cream, um, broth, so, uh, wow. soups, all of that needs to count into that fluid restriction. So it's two liters of fluid, two grams of sodium, so 2,000 milligrams. Um, and so sodium is, is a hard thing for people to get a, gra a grasp of, you know, because it's in everything. It hides in everything. It's in every canned food. It's in every, um, anything convenient at all <laughs> is going to be sodium loaded. So we um, try to talk to patients about ways to make that practical. Um, the other um, point I wanted to make too was that, you know, we talked about daily weights and how that helps kind of manage um, the heart failure. So what we tell people to keep it very, um, for the sake of simplicity, two pounds, then two liters of water, two grams of sodium, that way it's all two and so it's something that's easy to remember. So two liters, two grams, two pounds. What are some strategies that you tell patients as they're leaving the hospital you know, to, to give their food and stuff some flavor if they can't give up the Sure. Salt. So um, we usually, it's best to obviously cook for yourself at home. You can't control what's in food at restaurants. You just can't, you know. And um, while everybody posts their um, nutrition labels and all of that, you know, those fries over at McDonald's, how much sodium is in that really depends on how many people walk by and salted those fries. There's no control. Um, so the only way to control it really is to cook for yourself at home um, and to use, um, you know, fruits and vegetables and um, um, meats that have not already been been seasoned. Um, canned foods are cheaper, so you can buy foods and cans if you need to, but we encourage people to buy the low sodium versions, mm -hmm. but then also to rinse them and not cook them in the fluid that's within the can, but to rinse that out and cook it in water and then season it back up. Um, and as far as seasoning back up, Mrs. Dash is our favorite. Um, easy, it's in every grocery store and there are tons of different flavors um, that you can use. Um, also, um, garlic is fine, cinnamon, ginger, those sorts of things. Um, you want to stay away from some of those other things, for example, lemon pepper, because if you look on the back of lemon pepper, the first ingredient is salt. So it hides in those things too. Your Tony Sachery's seasonings uh, and all of those sorts of things that people like to use are primarily salt. Yeah, I would imagine you have to educate family members as well. Yes. When they're leaving, when that patient is leaving the hospital, is that really hard? It is, it is hard because it's so much easier if it's a lifestyle change for whomever, you know, is in the house really, you know, I mean, yeah. nobody wants to cook two different meals. Um, so those are, um, you know, and it's so much easier for the patient if everybody's kind of participating in eating the same thing and they don't feel left out or um, whatever. So there are really good um, low sodium recipes and things that um, people can use. The internet is loaded with those. And um, I am, as you mentioned, on the uh, American Association of Heart Failure Nurses, I am a part of their um, patient education committee. We have a um, website that has lots of resources for patients, tip sheets, but there's also a cookbook. It's called Pass the Salt and it has lots of um, good recipes in there. I, I, yeah, I think that that would be really hard. As not to come down on the south, but in the south, I mean, we like to eat fried Absolutely, we do. stuff and yeah, we, we do. Cajun it's and all hard. of that. Yeah. It's hard. And you know what happens is after big um, big events, Thanksgiving, Christmas, mm -hmm. those sorts of things, never fails that people will come into the hospital sick because they've had so much salt and all on their special occasions. Maybe I'm good all the time, but now it's yeah. 4th of July. And so um, those to find ways around that and to try to help keep people, nobody wants to come to the hospital and be readmitted for heart failure or anything else. And so if we can find ways to do that and make it practical for the patients, it's really important that we do. That's good. Um, so. How, what do you say to them to motivate them to comply with the medications? I mean, this is a big, it's a big deal once they get home. It is. I mean, it's a lot, I think, to, to fathom. It's a really big deal. Um, and uh, there are a ton of medicines, and some of them are, you know, every four hours. Um, so we, um, we 
really advocate using a pill box to keep yourself organized. There's a lot of medicines, so some pill boxes have, you know, multiple boxes where you can fill up for the whole week. So on Sunday, you sit down, you fill it up for the week, and then you've got everything in line for you. Um, another thing is um, we encourage people to consider setting alarms, especially those, for some reason, you know, the morning medicines are not too hard to remember because you can sit them right by your toothbrush and at night you can take your medicine skin because they're right there by your toothbrush or it's right you know you get in a habit that it's right before bed right. but the middle of the day and you're out and you're busy so um, setting reminders on your phone um, there are also um, small keychain size pill boxes that you can take oh. and put on your keychain to take with you so you'll have your noon medicines are right there um, yeah, so those are um, however we can make it practical and easy because and doable because it needs to be done. I think uh, this is a very, it's a personal discussion for me just because my grandpa had this, but we kind of labeled him as stubborn and mm -hmm. I feel a little bit bad about that now because mm -hmm. it was probably a hard regimen. So mm -hmm. what do you say to family members and even nurses who say, oh, that patient's just stubborn, they don't want it, sure. they don't want to comply. Well, and, and remember too that they are, um, they may not have the best cardiac output, you know, so they may not be moving blood to their head efficiently they may be a little bit confused and sometimes that's hard to tell you mm -hmm. know but they're they know often that they're not as sharp um, or they may um, be able to tell you that you know I'm just tired and I'm not you know I don't want to deal with this I don't want to have to worry with all of this so it's just about being compassionate and that loving approach they do need you know to take their medicines they do need to be active they do need to do those things um, it's it's all in the approach it's you know it's just you have to be very considerate of the fact that they are um, they're tired and they're it's, it's it can be very difficult and sometimes that can come better from the healthcare provider, you know, it just, you know, how we'll argue with our family, but then we go to the doctor's office and, okay, it really is important kind of thing, you know, and so um, nur nurses especially can help to be in a very, you know, understanding and calming and, um, you know, professional way, but, you know, this, this is really important. This is, you know, your daughter's just worried about you, your granddaughter's just concerned, and we want the best for you, and so... Are there support groups? There are support groups. Um, there are many support groups, actually. If you, um, you can certainly ask your healthcare provider. They will know exactly what is, you know, in the immediate area, wherever you are. But there are, uh, Mended Hearts comes to mind. It's a national um, group, and they have little subgroups in different um, areas. Um, there are, um, for example, I know that um, the transplant program at UAB has its own support group. Um, I've also worked with uh, the School of Nursing's um, nurse-led heart failure clinic and we um, had a support group specific to that population the population of patients that we were serving there so there are many support groups around and it really helps sometimes to find out and to know that there are others that are in the same boat and sometimes they have ideas of things that worked and can share recipes and all of those things and it's good to feel like you're not alone exactly I yeah. think that would be really important right. Uh, so we've got about just two two minutes left or so. So, okay. what do you want us to take away from from this conversation? What would be the most important thing to impart? Um, I think that the most important thing is to help people at discharge to understand what this regimen is going to be, why they need to do what they need to do. Um, medications are so cumbersome. So that really strong um, from the nurses perspective, a really good uh, medication reconciliation is important. Also remember to kind of dig and delve into your patient's situation a little bit because you can write or you, the provider can write all the prescriptions that they want and you hand them to the patient, but if the patient can't afford to go and get them, they're not going to take them and they're not going to be effective. So, you know, if dig into that a little bit. There are resources um, as far as, um, you know, Publix has some meds for free and um, if uh, Walmart has, you know, low price meds. And so there are often resources. They just, the patients may need help and be pointed, need, need to be pointed in those directions. Perfect. Thank you so much. That Thank was a you. really wonderful discussion. 
as always, I could just sit and talk with you and our, <laughs> our guests all day long about uh, this information. You're such an expert. So we really appreciate you being here. We're lucky to have you on our faculty. And we appreciate everyone that joined us today. And we will see you next time on Clinical Pearls. If you liked this video, please remember to like and subscribe and click the bell icon to get instant notifications when we release new videos. For more information on how to get CEU credits or for more on the UAB School of Nursing in general, check out the description below. Thanks for watching.